loveys. Thank you for joining us on another edition of A Little Perspective. Tonight I have one of my great friends, Annie Sanders, joining me. I'm going to be chatting with Annie about her involvement in the community and her nonprofit, Safe Haven Center for Domestic Violence. Annie um, has really done wonderful things with this organization. It is so needed, especially here on the coast. And I can't wait to talk to her about how she um, got started and just really ran headfirst with this thing. Annie, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hello, everybody. My name is Annie Sanders. I am a native here of the Gulf Coast. I'm a mother of one lovely daughter. She is 10 years old. Her name is Dora. I am also, um, I've graduated with a bachelor's degree in uh, business management and also accounting. And I'm actually working on another uh, concentration so that I can better improve my business operations. And I also have a, another business that I do uh, operations for other companies here on the Gulf Coast. Um, I started my nonprofit back in 2017 whenever I was leaving another facility because it was actually closing down at the time. So I knew I always wanted to start an organization such as this, um, being a survivor myself. So I just decided that that was actually the perfect time to get started. Awesome. Yeah, um, starting a nonprofit is no joke for, for real. But um, so Annie and I have known each other a while and I'm not I don't even know how we met. We both, kind of, <laughs> we both kind of run in the same circles and we like to network. And, um, and so, you know, we had met and we had chatted and friend, been friends and such. And at some point I was somewhere talking with someone else um, about how much I just adored her. And somebody said, um, doesn't she, or have you heard her story or something like that? And I was like, her story? And um, I thought Annie's a good, Annie's funny. Annie cracks me up. So I thought they meant like some kind of a joke or, you know, some kind of funny <laughs> story, but it was not a funny story. But um, so then the next time, you know, they said, oh no, she's been through a lot. She really has quite the story um, to tell of, of survival. And uh, so the next time I saw her, I, you know, I asked her about it and, um, and she shared it with me. And and it is, it is quite something. It is, um, it is a lifetime story, if, if I may say so. Um, <laughs> yes. So, um, you know, I, I, obviously that was kind of your motivation for starting this center. Um, so how did, you, how did you begin to begin this thing? So um, I decided to go on this, I guess, my professor Google at the time told me how to start a nonprofit because there's so many different um, so many different ways that you can go about it. But of course, I had to do it the most cost efficient way I knew how. I couldn't hire an attorney. I could not hire an accountant. And of course, I have a background in accounting, so that portion of it I knew would be taken care of. It was mainly, you know, I've never started a nonprofit in my life, and they are not easy to start. Um, so of course, I started the Okay, let me start from square one. What is the first thing I need to do? Come up with a name. Okay, so coming up with a name, registering with the Secretary of State, and of course, registering under a, um, a charity, then you got to go over to the IRS. And there's so many different components in starting it. So once you get the red tape done, it's like, okay, now what? Well, that's not even, I thought that that was a hard part. No, it is not. Uh, so we have been, you know, We've been incorporated since 2017. So as of right now, we're just, uh, I don't want to say just, a, we are a resource center for uh, people who are experiencing domestic violence and uh, who needs resources. And we offer many different ones to them. But getting started, of course, um, I knew that I wanted to, I knew that this is something that I really, really, really wanted to do. I knew there was a need for it. I was a resident of a domestic violence shelter here on the coast. And I recognized that whenever I was a resident that my, I don't want to say my healing because it sounds a little selfish, but my ability to be in a place such as that, and it's not, not in a bad way, but psychologically it can kind of mess with you like wow I'm, I'm in a shelter right now I'm in a shelter with my child and you don't necessarily know how to process the information you're just trying to be you know you're just still trying to parent and trying to make sure your child is okay meanwhile you were kind of going through something very traumatic as well oh, yeah. so I've learned that a lot of that 
it it helped me get through it by helping my I guess fellow residents who were there at the time and I told myself once I'm out of the crisis um, stage of survival in a sense that this is something that I, I had to do because you know um, you can easily get turned away because of capacity in any of these facilities uh, whether it's here Mobile New Orleans you know there are, are even in Pascagoula I know there's one there as well and we just have a large population here on the coast and with the numbers being as high as they are I knew that that's something that needed to be done and uh, I was gonna <laughs> go down in flames trying to do it if I needed to, so. Yeah, you have a tendency to um, do things, do them. You really do them. You don't half-ass things. You you do them all the way. You have to, because <laughs> this so, is all, it's something else. <laughs> you mentioned, um, I think you said crisis stage, is that, um, yep. is that? So why don't you tell us a little bit more about the different stages? So basically once you're, um, in the beginning, I don't want to miss, I guess, miscategorize anything uh, the way someone else or the way that it is particularly naturally recognized. But the whenever you are first out of your abusive situation and away from your abuser, then you basically go into your crisis stage. So your crisis stage is um, once you're first out, it can include a lot of trauma and a lot of restabilization. So going through that stage is definitely um, one of the toughest times to go through because, you know, um, something so simple as a smell could trigger someone. You know, I actually, it was maybe two weeks out for me and I finally started to venture out and um, I was actually in the dollar store and I, there was a smell that had, um, I don't know what it was from. I don't, I couldn't tell you, but all I knew was that my abuser was at the dollar store, which that actually was not the case. It was just, the trauma portion of it had me thinking that um, I was still being hunted. Mm -hmm. And and that was one of those things where, you know, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to be out in public. I'm not ready to be around anybody. So I knew my crisis, my, my trauma was still pretty heavy at the time. So realistically, your crisis stage is about two years total. Uh, so I'm a little bit longer. I would not say shorter because uh, after about a year, I thought, oh, I'm fine, there's nothing going on. But um, that was just me being stubborn <laughs> and not realizing that, yes, that this is not a quick fix. This is not just getting away from your abuser is not going to solve, you know, everything that had happened because, you know, my, my, I was with my abuser for almost 11 years. So that is not something that is a, a quick fix. You don't just, get away from them and everything ends. The right. psychological trauma behind it is a lot more substantial than the physical part of it. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think so often, um, and I've been doing a lot of research on fight or flight because um, you know, being, a, being a life coach and a wellness coach, your, your mind, people think fight or flight is, is literally um, like you, you need to fight or you need to run, which it does that it is that but it's so much more than that and um it really is just your brain trying to keep you safe and anything that it um interprets as unsafe which could literally be like running around the block um you know it doesn't have to be an abuser or a dog attacking you or anything like that and um and so I've been learning about the um, the feelings loop. And so having to close that loop is really what's key to processing feelings. And yes. when you're, when you're living in trauma, you, you never close the loop mm -hmm. during that time because you, your, your um, trauma is there. It, you yes. know, your, your attacker is there, your abuser is there, but people also assume that, once you're gone and the abuser is gone, then, then that the um, fright is gone, but it's not because you still haven't closed that loop. And right. so I could definitely see how it would take at least two years to be able to kind of process those things and kind of start yes. to feel somewhat safe again. And even that is probably not the best word to use because you still yeah, have to be living in fear. I'm sure. Um, right. And and to kind of like put that into 
I guess more of a um, a way to understand it a little bit more. So yes, you are very right about the feelings loop, like how to, to close it. It's almost like there's always going to be a gap. There's always going to be a gap there, no matter, I'm not going to say no matter how hard you work, because, you know, you do work hard to get out of that. But um, the way that I ha I've had it explained to me and done the research as well is there's a part of our brain called the amygdala. I want to say that I am pronouncing that correctly. If I am not, move you past it. <laughs> So this is part of your brain and that's where you that's where your brain tries to protect you and tries to alert you and tries to let you know hey you know you may need to rethink this it's like our i call it our animal instinct um usually whenever you're in this type of situation it is always i want to say activated i just mm -hmm. i'm just going to call it that um that's because Thank that's you. how i understand it so that's how i explain it you're, mm -hmm. it's always on it is always activated it actually kind of makes your body susceptible to to different Illness. elements it definitely does. Mm -hmm. So if you um, are in that, um, you know, by flight or freeze stage all the time, it can wear on your body and it can wear on your body really, really badly uh, from the inside out. So being able to decipher what is, you know, what is danger and what is not takes a long time to, to kind of, find that balance you know i have my i i am in therapy i'll shout it from the rooftop you know i'll shout it from anywhere i need to absolutely um, i have been in therapy i will stay in therapy until i can figure out how to navigate myself now i am in therapy for more than just you know my um my abusive past i still you know have to talk to her about what's going on now but one of the things that she um said to me one day is she said Amy, you do know not all relationships are like this. And I had no idea because I started talking about apparently other people, <laughs> you know, um, saying, well, I'm pretty sure, or I feel like, or I know. And she said, no, 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 no. She said, you have to go a little bit deeper with that and not necessarily think that every relationship is exactly like yours was. So that kind of hit me a little harder because I had gotten with my ex whenever I was 17 years old. And of course I had gotten married um, not long before my 19th birthday. So I'd never really been in a, uh, I guess you call it a real relationship at the time. So that's all I knew. Like that was the only relationship I knew. So of course in my mind, I'm thinking that everybody goes through this. Everybody's dealing with the same thing because on some level, that's what he made me feel like. Mm -hmm. This is normal. This is what everybody goes through. So mm -hmm. if you think that you have a story, you do not. You know, it's like, no, I don't want this story. That's not the story I want. <laughs> no, I think, no, that's not what I, that's not what I asked for. <laughs> but, um, but she, whenever she said that, it kind of struck a chord with me of, oh my goodness, yeah, I think, I think that is what I've been thinking for a very long time. That's not true. So, um, even with my marriage now, you know, it's like going through therapy while I'm in my new marriage that I've been, we've been married for four years, just this past Monday, but um, we've been together for five years. And it was at the beginning, it was very tough. It was like, I'm waiting for something big to happen and it never did. So that was another reason why she had to kind of say, Hey, <laughs> mm -hmm. that's not normal. That's not what a relationship looks like. Right. So of right. course, working really hard to, to make sure my daughter sees that, you know, to kind of, I don't want to say deprogram her from my first right. marriage, but it is in a sense of mm -hmm. making sure she understands what a healthy relationship looks like, right. whether she decides to get married or not. So, right. That's yeah, actually why, um, so my ex-husband's a narcissist and he was very like mentally and emotionally abusive. He wasn't physically abusive, but and he was really good at it. Um, my, and the reason I left was because I didn't want the kids growing up thinking that that was how a relationship was supposed to be. So I knew it wasn't, even though I grew up, my dad was physically and mentally and emotionally abusive to my mom and to us, but um, really very physically abusive to my mom. And he was six foot three and my mom's four foot. And um, this was really traumatizing, but I knew like, that's not, that's not how things are supposed to go. Um, but I still ended up in a similar situation. Mm -hmm. 
but I was able to say like, okay, this is not, this is not how it's supposed to be. And it took me, we were married for 10 years and took me, I was um, pregnant. I got pregnant with my son five years in and he's, he's our second. And when I found it was a boy, I was like, okay, something's got to give because I can't raise him to be like this. Like, I'm not going to do that. And, and honestly, I should have said, I'm not going to raise my daughter to think my oldest daughter to think that this is love. But, um, but that was, that was what I thought. And that's how it went. And, um, you know, but I stuck around because I thought I could fix them. I thought I could. Oh, yes. (laughs) We, we have the, the ability to think that, okay, uh, life events are going to change their behavior. Mm -hmm. Same situation. I had gotten pregnant with Dora about four years in to the marriage. And I was thinking, okay, this may be it. This may soften him. This may, you know, change the outcome of whatever this unstable, unhealthy nonsense has been thus far. Um, I was completely wrong. You know, I mean, at one point I was in the hospital bleeding because he had made me you know, he attacked me in the shower and I fell directly on my belly. So of course it was like, yeah, that's not it. That's not going to stop him. Then it was, okay, well maybe, well maybe he has to see the baby or maybe, you know, there's a disconnect still there. And, um, you know, ultimately after, of course, after leaving him, you realize it's like, babies are too young to have jobs. You know, why are we, why did I justify that at that time and say, well, she's going to fix it. She's going to like, no, she, <laughs> she's me. She doesn't have a job. Why is she, why am I giving her this job to fix someone who doesn't want to fix themselves? Right. It makes no sense. So of course, you know, you rationalize so many different ways of mm-hmm. the reason why, why it hasn't stopped, but ultimately um, it's a lot more psychological than you think it is. And I had not, realized that the year and a half or so to two years, I don't know, my memory's all messed up, but the year and a half to two years or so that we were dating, he had already been grooming me and I had no idea. I had no idea. And that's where I am so passionate about getting to youth and letting them know, this is what this looks like. This is what this sounds like. Tell us, you know, tell us about grooming. What does that mean? I, I agree so, completely, but yeah. a lot of, it's not, um, it's not a very common term. It's not, it is, it's more or less of, um, the manipulation by a narcissist on a, on a regular basis. So what that may look like is, you know, let's say you and your partner are getting ready and your partner has been experienced, you know, has been showing, you know, signs of, um, aggression in any type of way, maybe even not a showing aggression, but um, saying little things that make you kind of pause and look at them for a minute. So um, I want to say, if I can remember correctly, and this is about as far back as my memory can go, um, it was one day we were supposed to be going, I'm trying to remember, I want to say to a restaurant to meet friends or some, uh, I think his friends. And I get dressed and I get ready, and it was like, all right, I'm going to pick you up. So came and picked me up. And before I even got in the car, it was, are you sure you're going to wear that? Yeah, this is all I'm going to wear. It's fine. Like, I don't know. It looks a little, looks like you're showing a little too much. Then it, and it's like, wait a minute. I'm 17 years old. I have a mother who has raised me, you know, as good as she could. That's what I like to say. I don't want to say she raised me right because I have strayed off a little bit, but (laughs) she has raised me well enough to know that I'm not going to step foot out the side, you know, outside of the house looking less than presentable. And at the time, I mean, although I had a job, my mother still bought my clothes and Cynthia's not going to buy anything revealing. So of course I'm standing there second guessing myself thinking, what am I wearing? And I said, no, everything's fine. And he said, well, okay, well, um, I don't know, maybe the shirt, maybe it's just the shirt. And it sounds like, okay, well maybe I am 
overthinking this. Maybe, maybe my shirt is a little too revealing. I don't know. Maybe, okay, well, I'll go and put on a different shirt. And I went on and put on a different shirt. Then it was the shoes. Then it was the bottoms, whether it was pants or, or shorts. And then it was the hair. Then it, it was hair. And it's like, what's wrong with my hair? You know, so it, then it started to manifest itself. And then it turns into, um, who are you talking to on your phone? Who are you? And it's like, my friends, you know, who are you talking to at school? You know, when I was in college, you would come visit me at school. And it was, well, yeah, I, I've been sitting here in my car. Who have you been talking to? And it's like, oh my gosh, it's just my friend. You know, me, Annie over here. I was just like, oh, it's nothing. It's people, it's friends. You could have got out of your car and talked to us. And then it was, oh, no, 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 no. I didn't want to interrupt. And so that one, that particular story did kind of strike me. I was thinking, I've been standing out here talking to these people for the better part of two hours. And you sitting in your car watching me walk up and start talking and it turned into like this group of maybe six or seven people talking together we've been out here a long time so that means that you've been out here but of course i'm rationalizing in my head oh well maybe you are shy now this is just yes we have that instinct we do we have it your your our body start to tell us this isn't right there is something to miss here but we rationalize we compartmentalize we not don't we don't necessarily completely remove it but we make an excuse for it and um that's one of the things that a lot of youth um i mean even adults but i see it a lot more in younger the younger generation is able to rationalize and say oh well it's just he just loves me. me he just loves me he just loves me. me yes or even, uh, in all honesty, uh, the youth now, it's becoming a lot, a lot of um, females are, are being very, very controlling of their boyfriends as well. Yeah. And even, you know, the LGBTQIA mm-hmm. plus community as well, it's a, there's a lot there. And then even in that community, they feel like they can't get to anybody because they feel like they're going to be scrutinized because they're not with who someone may feel that they should be with so they are still you know in silence and um rationalizing mm-hmm. the lead where their partner is saying that they are their intentions are but their intentions are not good for you mm-hmm. um embarrassing you in front of your peers or um it's just and, jokes i'm just joking i was just joking you don't you take a you joke there you go you can't take a joke and then it starts to become Oh, you're hanging out with your friend Jennifer. I don't like that girl. So Last that's year, where it's bad influence. That's where my grooming started. Was mm-hmm. it was? Why are you friends with them? They're not. They don't even care about you. They. I mean, you are always doing things for them, and they never do anything for you. You haven't mm-hmm. noticed that. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're such a sucker. Like, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. And it's slow. It was never, it was always subtle like that. It was never like, I forbid you to hang out with them. Yes. It would, be subtle. it would be. And then I would go hang out with someone. And when I would come home, it would be moping for two or three days because I just don't have any friends. Nobody likes me. You have, mm-hmm. and, and then, so then the next time I'd want to go, I try to get him to go. He wouldn't want to go. And then I would say, he would say, it's fine. Just go. I'll just be here. You know, like it was the, it was the subtle Mm -hmm. guilt of, you know, yeah, I'm fine. It's fine. But then two days after it would be moping of not having any friends and being so misunderstood. And, um, and then it would be the, I mean, why, I don't know why you go over there. She never comes over here. Why do you mm-hmm. want to go over there? Why well, you always got to go over there? Yeah. Um, is there something y'all are trying to hide? Mm-hmm. What are you doing? Oh, because your friend is a bad influence. They're mm-hmm. going to cover for you because you're doing things behind my back. And then it's like, well, I don't want you to think that I'm doing anything behind your back. So it's going to be like a tapering off type of thing. It's like a dec- decline because if you feel like I'm doing something behind your back with my friends that I'm just going to hang out with and it has absolutely nothing to do with you. Um, 
So in order to keep you from attacking me in any type of way, I'm going to eliminate that and appease you. And all the while, not only was it this friend, now this friend has a problem. Mm -hmm. Now, oh no, because all of y'all were friends. So all of you all the same. So then it, and it, then it turns into this snowball of, well, I just won't go anywhere. I won't go anywhere. I won't hang out with anybody. Yeah. It's just, it's not worth the fight. It's It's not not worth worth the, it's not, it just is easier. And then you end up isolating yourself, which then, yep. but then, then they get them more control. Absolutely. Then they start working on your family. So Ooh, then that one, that's the one where it was uh, my mother and I, after I had left and she um, helped me, of course, I finally said something. I didn't tell her, yes, I'm being abused, but I gave her enough breadcrumbs to know. Um, I don't have time to tell you a story, but I do need your help. So she was able to pick up on that being a survivor of her own, you know, from my childhood um, that I honestly do not remember, but (laughs) it it did happen. Um, But it was, we started to recognize that he would call her and tell her all kinds of things. And then she would say, well, where is she? And it would be, she went to the store or she did this or she went here or she's not around or, you know, call her at two o'clock in the morning and, and tell these stories and talk about how, you know, I'm saying all of these mean things about my mother and, you know, and my mom's like, it never made any sense because you, you and I kept in touch and this, not any other. So, um, but then he would tell me, you know what your mom called me and told me, you know, you know what your mom said about me or said about you and said about us and, um, one of the main things was, you know, I asked your mom for, um, if I could marry you or get her permission to marry you, you know what she told me? She told me to stay away from you. And I was like, that never happened. That conversation never happened. She said, because if it had happened, she's like, and you know me well enough. And I was like, I know, but this is how they, you know, and so she, she understood completely. She's like, but that's, that's what they do. They, they make you think these things. And um, I was young and impressionable at the time. Uh, clearly I was 18 and you know it was your mom doesn't want us to be together and then it became um, an interracial thing because my ex-husband is not black and so it became a oh she doesn't want us together because uh you know she wants you to be with a black guy and then it started to then it turned into this racial thing and it was like you know when I think back on it and she and I have had many conversations since then um and it's just it's one of those things and it was like they are really, um, I'm going to try to say this in a, in, in a, I guess, a constructive way. Um, they are individuals who do not understand how much help they need. They need a lot of help from whatever trauma they experienced. Um, they don't they don't have any coping skills Mm -mm. and preying on people is their coping skill that is the only way that they know how to operate and unfortunately um when you have that type of combination at the end of the day they do not think that they have anything wrong with them Mm -mm. you know so it becomes like a, a a tug of war you know it's like you do have a problem. You, this is not okay to treat people this way. And then it's, you know, the blame game. Well, I wouldn't treat you like this if you didn't act like that. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, and they will have you thinking that you are the one that's in the wrong. That's crazy, and yeah. They'll make you feel crazy. They will make you feel crazy. They will make you feel like you have provoked all of this outrage. And, but at the end of the day, Nobody deserves to have someone else mm-hmm. put their hands on you, um, nor even suffer the psychological abuse because, you know, my wounds have healed, not all the way, but for the most part, they have. The thing that I work on the most now is the psychological portion of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know what I mean? So those internal scars are longer lasting mm-hmm. than your external scars. So, but the way that they're able to manipulate every situation, it's a, it's almost... It's frightening because they do it with ease. And well, they, they believe it. it. They believe they, what they, they say. believe it. They live in an altered reality. Yes, they and yeah. and the thing, and they love empaths because you know we can 
we see that they're damaged. We see that they have suffered trauma. We see that they, yeah. and, and unfortunately, you know, that, that sucks because that's not necessarily their fault. But, you know, I have always said that once you're, once you're of a certain age, then you're no longer, you know, you're responsible for your actions and your right. thoughts and your feelings and your healing. And, um, but they, they love impasse because impasse just want to fix them. Yes. And, and you mentioned the family thing. And, and, and my version of the family thing is that um, we have a very, very small family. Um, it was just, it was, it was um, my, my mom, my kids, my sister, my grandpa, my uncle, and that's it. Like, we don't have cousins. We don't like, we don't have anything. I don't have any family on my dad's side. He was an only child. And so we're, we were very close. And so we would do all the holidays together. We would do birthdays and all that. Well, he hated that stuff. And it was, you know, he always said because of his childhood and stuff. And, and I don't know if that's true or not at this point, but, mm -hmm. um, but I believed it and, and it made sense. And so I would either go and leave him or I would drag him and he would make all of us uncomfortable and miserable. Um, and then it got at the end, it got, you know, in the last few years, it got to the point where he was, he was starting to make me choose between mm -hmm. Christmas with, with him and the kids or there and so luckily my family is understanding and they're like we'll just do it another day like it doesn't have to be the 25th it doesn't have to be this <laughs> yeah but he was always trying to find a way to drive that wedge and and again the comments the insults the such and such and such you know about the family and how um you know you do everything for them and they don't do any, you know all yeah. that stuff um okay yeah, Annie, so i feel like we haven't even scratched the surface <laughs> and um it's been it's been a little bit and i have a call coming up so i want to ask you if you'll do a part two with me um another day because i want to talk about gaslighting i want to talk about what can we do about our youth um our kids the kids other kids in the community that aren't ours you know how can we educate and you know, just empower them because that's where it really begins. Um, and with kids having sex at younger nowadays, you know, that, that scares me so much. Um, and you know, there's, there's other things that we haven't even begun to touch. And, and then I also want to talk about the work that you do. So, um, do you, will you do part two with me, please? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So, um, so I think this is a good, stopping point for now that way we don't um we don't start anything that we can't pick up and then um we'll pick up on part two where we we get a little bit more in depth about um what we can do as adults for the kids what we can do as adults for ourselves gaslighting some other red flags and then um mm -hmm. and then what what you do and the services you offer and and the and that kind of stuff so Awesome. Thank you. So I feel like I just had a therapy session. So thank you so much. No, I <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Annie. And um, thank you guys for watching and stay tuned for part two. Um, because this is, it's going to get even better. There's going to be much, much better information. So, so much. So much. <laughs> so All right. Bye y'all. Bye.